everybody, it's Pastor Tavner. I just want to take a second and say thank you so much for tuning in to Venue Church right here online. Welcome. You are part of the family. And I'm so excited that we're literally getting to build God's kingdom and change the world together. Hey, if you tuned in, just take a second before you move forward with the video and like it, comment, subscribe to our YouTube page, and turn on all your alerts because you don't want to miss everything that God's doing through us, me and you together at Venue Church. A couple more things. I just wanted to remind you that something as easy as sharing this link can really help someone. So if you know somebody going through some things, they need a little bit of God in their life, we say it like this around Venue. Just share the link, and when you do, you share the love. I'm telling you, it can change somebody with one simple click on your phone. And if you'd love to give to the ministry, there's some easy ways that we're going to put on the screen because your finances are helping us make a difference, not just here in Chattanooga, but all over the world. Hey, God's doing something special through this house, and I'm excited for you to hear the word that he's got today. So listen, sit up straight, lean in, get your notepad ready, enjoy the word. I'll see you soon. I love you. Well, what's up, venue? How are y'all this morning? Who's ready for some word today? Come on, make a little bit of noise in this place. I know I am. I'm super excited about talking to you today. I just wanted to mention that we start a brand new season of talks next week called The Assignment, and I'm so excited about it. I hope that you'll be here and not just here on Easter. I know Easter's a great time to come, and I'm so glad you showed up today, but I hope you'll continue to come back every single week because it is not what you do occasionally that'll change your life. It's what you do consistently that'll change your life. And listen, my messages are not going to change you. They're going to challenge you. But it's getting involved in community that will change you. And there's an amazing community of people at this church, people that, if, that, that you can be real with, people that look at you and say you're not just welcome but you're wanted, people who you think your story would blow their mind, they could probably three up you on their story where they came from. You ain't got to worry. You're safe. It's a place where everybody is welcome and wanted at this place. And I wanted to invite you back every single week. By the way, your kids are going to want to come back. They're going to bug you so much this week because they're back there having an Easter egg hunt, doing crafts, jumping on bouncy houses, and we're filling them so full of sugar, you're not going to be able to calm them down today. And you know what they're going to do all week? They're going to say, take me back to that place. Take me back to that place. And they're going to be hugely disappointed if you don't next week. So we don't want to disappoint the children, do we? No, we don't. I'm so glad you're here. And we're going to start an amazing new series. And this is what I wanted to say about it is everybody in this room and most of the people you know have wondered a question in their life, and that is this. Why am I even here? Why do I exist? What is my purpose? What is this all about? And I'm going to talk to you about your assignment over the next few weeks. And it's going to be something that I think is going to really give you a grasp on why you were created, how you were created, why you are who you are, where, why you are where you're at, and what God wants you to do with your life. I think you're going to walk out of here over the next few weeks, and you're going to just be refreshed and excited about waking up every day and breathing and doing life wherever you're at, in Chattanooga, North Georgia, or this surrounding area, or watching us anywhere you're at. So y'all ready to get started today? Come on, make a little noise in this place. Let me jump right into the scripture. Matthew chapter 28 says this, it says, early on Sunday morning, you can follow us on the screen, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and then sat on it. And his face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow, and the guards shook with fear when they saw him. And they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. I want to take the next few minutes and I want to speak to you on this thought. The rhythm of resurrection. 
I want to talk to you. I want to challenge you. I want to take you on a journey and talk to you about the rhythm of resurrection. So, Father, right now, I pray you just prepare every single person's heart. Here's what I wanted to ask. Whatever they've been through this week, could you just let them lay it down for a second? I always say the thing that, that, that the enemy's scared of the most is what he fights the most. So I'm sure he was terrified that they get in this house here and get in your worship and in your presence and around your word and around your people and around amazing community. He was terrified. He didn't want it to happen. So I'm sure this week has had a lot of drama and distractions in some people's lives. But I pray that today you would give them the ability to just lay it down for the next 20, 25 minutes. And just listen to you. They're on a divine appointment right now. They were appointed that seat they're in. And you're going to do something special in every one of us. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody said amen. amen. The rhythm of resurrection. I, I'm, uh, I don't know if you know this about me. You probably can't tell. I probably don't look it. Uh, as you, as you look at me just standing up here on stage, but there was a time in my life where I was a really good basketball player. I mean, y'all, I guess you would say it this way. I was a baller, shot caller, 20-inch blades on the Impala. I'm just messing with you. Y'all know what I'm saying? Anybody know what I'm saying? Y'all are late? Y'all are late. I don't know. I, but, but here's how I, you know how some people get old. I'm not that old. I'm 41. I, you know, some people get to be 41, and they talk about their high school days as like that was their glory years. Can I just say this? My glory days are not back there. I hope I'm with you, you're with me. My glory days are still ahead of me. Can I get an amen? So I'm not reminiscing on my glory days. I'm just telling you some facts. I was a baller, but I didn't really start playing organized basketball until I was like in the seventh grade. I played at home all the time in the neighborhood with my brothers and a couple of the neighbors. I didn't really play on a team team until I was like in the seventh grade. And I wasn't great at all when I first started. I was nervous. I was hyper. I was scared. So I'd, I was that guy that I'd barely get in, and then at the end they'd put me in, and I'd foul like eight people in two minutes, and like that was me. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I was scared of the most? I was scared the most of having to shoot a free throw. Because I felt like in that moment, you know, you can get away. There's 10 other people running around. Parents are watching their kids. But a free throw, nobody's running. You're the only one on the line, and everybody in the whole room's just staring at you. And they're like, here's their thought. Nobody's guarding this kid. Of course he's going to make this, right? So you feel this pressure. And I never could do it good. I get so nervous, I'd airball, or I'd, I'd bounce it off the rim. I wouldn't ever make it. And in the 10th grade, I remember my coach. He came up, Coach Ricky Roop, he said this, he said, Tavner, you got great athleticism, you got great potential, you got speed, you're really good, you seem to know how to play defense and know the game. He said, do you know what your problem is? I was like, what? Tell me my problem. He's like, you, you just need to find your rhythm. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, shooting's all about a rhythm. If you can get into your rhythm and find your rhythm, he said, you could be able to shoot the lights out. And I was like, that sounds great, but I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> He's like, let me give you an example. You're afraid of free throws? Here's what you need to do. You need to find a rhythm. If, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick something, and I want you to make it a rhythm. I want you to make it a movement, and I want you to do that thing over and over every single time you shoot a free throw from now to the day you die. Never change it. Do it, and you'll become a great free throw shooter. So I tried a bunch of things, but you know what I landed on? I landed on this. Three dribbles a spin, bounce twice, shoot. Three dribbles, a spin, bounce twice, shoot. Three dribbles, a spin, bounce twice, shoot. I found my rhythm. Did you know what I used to do? Before I would leave the gym my sophomore, junior, and senior year, before I'd leave, everybody else was done, before I'd leave, I'd shoot 300 free throws, I'd shoot 300 three-pointers, and then I'd leave the gym. I got to the point where after a while, I could shoot lights out anywhere in the gym. I can still shoot it like that if I get in my rhythm. But I'm telling you, when I was doing my free throw, I got to the point I could do 100 free throws in a row and not miss. Easy. 
I could do three, I could, I remember one time I was shooting a bunch of three-pointers, and he's like, do it left hand. I turned it left hand and just started hitting three-pointers. I mean, I could shoot. I was a baller. I found my rhythm. And my, finding my rhythm and finding my place made me desire to be a part of something I was afraid of. And I want to talk to you today about the rhythm of resurrection. And I'm not talking about just the resurrection of Jesus. He rose. He's alive. He lives in us. We're going to do great things. But do you know what? God wants to resurrect some things in you. And do you know when we don't know the rhythm of resurrection, can you know, do you know what we do? We run from the rhythm that is trying to happen in our life. We're afraid of it. We don't want to be a part of it. We run from it, and we don't let it have its way when God's really trying to do something big in me and you. And here's what I wanted to do today. I just wanted to dive into this story, and I wanted to show you and help you understand where you're at in life. Because if you don't understand this rhythm of resurrection, you'll want to quit in a time that's supposed to be hard because you don't understand it's supposed to be hard. You can make it to everything God created you to do if you understand the rhythm, rhythm of resurrection. And I just want to talk through that a little bit today. Will you go on that journey with me? Will you lean in? Because if you understand this, everything can change. I want to be very encouraging I wanted the first one to just be something that you shouted and loved and were like, man, I'm coming back every week. This guy's the nicest guy. He told me the nicest thing. When I heard number one, when I figured out what the rhythm of resurrection, the first part of the rhythm was, I was like, oh, I don't want to say this first. <laughs> but it's necessary. Here's the rhythm of res resurrection. Number one is this. Are you ready? The first part of the rhythm is this, the death. In order for something to be resurrected, y'all got to hear me, something's got to die. In order for something to be resurrected, something has to die. And I know when I say the word death, we think negative. I know when I say the word death, we think fear. I know when I say the word death, we think afraid. But can I tell you, not just death in general, but this part of the rhythm of resurrection, the death is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, and it's something that every one of us deal with. But if we don't understand what we're dealing with, we will run and we will hide from this process of the resurrection in our life, and we will never see everything God has intended for us. See, today's Easter. Today's a great day. Today's a fun day. Today is the day we all wear pink and we dress up and we do all of our stuff. And here we are to celebrate. You know what it is? We're here to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ, on the third day, rolled the stone back from the tomb, walked out, and, and, and defeated death 100% resurrected. That's what Easter is all about, right? He's alive, and now he lives in us. Listen. But he couldn't have gotten out of the tomb if he never went through a death that put him in the tomb. He couldn't have defeated the grave. He couldn't have defeated hell. He couldn't have defeated the authority of Satan. He couldn't have taken back the keys to the kingdom. He couldn't have created everything he's created for us to live a life that we can live in Christ if he had not gone through a death to put him in a place that he could be resurrected. And I know... I know that, that, that we, we, we say, yeah, amen, that's good. We, we think about Jesus' death, but I don't think we comprehend his death. I don't think that we, we can actually wrap our minds around Jesus' death. You know why? Because we're, we're, a, we're a generation, we live in a place and a time where we wear crosses around our neck as a celebration. But in Jesus' time, wearing a cross around your neck would have been like wearing an electric chair around your neck. It would have been like wearing a, a needle around your neck to, to represent lethal injection. It was not a thing of celebration. It was a thing of humiliation and punishment. It was the actual worst way someone could be punished at that time is to be crucified. And I want you to think about Jesus. We're celebrating his resurrection, but he had to go through a death in order to get there. And it was a brutal one, y'all. 
I don't know if you can even comprehend and, and, and imagine what he went through, but, but from the time he got falsely accused, standing in front of the judges, they didn't even wait to convict him and call him guilty. Before they even convicted him, they blindfolded him. And people would come in and start punching him in the face while he was blindfolded. He couldn't even see when and where it was coming from. And then they would mock him and say, if you're God, tell me who just punched you. They would spit their nasty spit in his face, in his mouth, in his eyes, right there, one after another, lined up, coming by, spitting in his face, punching him, grabbing his beard and ripping his beard out. And then in that moment, taking him while they decided his fate and throw him in a dark, damp dungeon so he could wait to see what was going to happen. They brought him out of that, stripped all his clothes off of him naked and took him into the front of everybody in the middle of the town, strapped him to a pole and beat him 39 times with a whip that they called the cat of nine tails. It had nine straps on it with all types of sharp things so when they hit him, it would like sink in like a fish hook and rip his skin out. They, they watched him bleed. They didn't just whip his back. They whipped his legs, his face, his chest, his stomach, his feet, his hands, his arms, his head, his neck. Everything whipped his entire body 39 times. Till it says you can read that he was unrecognizable. And they took a crown of thorns, thorns so big that it would have pierced his eye sockets, and they beat it into his head with, with a staff and made fun of him like he was a king. Then they took a robe, and they would let the robe be on him, on his, on his wounds and dry and let it scab up, and then they would rip it off and open his wounds again. And then they put a rugged, heavy piece of wood on him that was the top part of the cross, and they made him, after almost bleeding to death, being spit on, beaten, and then beaten with the whips, they made him carry his own cross to the place they would lay him down and put nails in his wrists and in his ankles and then put him naked in front of everybody. Not like you picture it up on a hill, like, oh, there he is up on the hill. No, they crucified him two inches off the ground right beside the road so everybody on their way home could stop by and make fun of him and spit on him as they went home. They took a sponge a sponge that the upper class people used to wipe their rear ends after they went to the bathroom, dipped it in vinegar and shoved it in his mouth when he said he was thirsty. They took a spear and drove it through his ribs and his side and his lungs into his heart. It was a brutal death. It was not a fun death. It was not an easy death. It was not a death anybody would want to pay. Even the Son of God. If you read about him before that came, listen, here's what you'll read. You'll read that before he even encountered all of that, he stopped in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said this. We're talking about Jesus, perfect Jesus, the Son of God. Went to God and said this. He said, please, if there's any other way, let me do something different. If there's any way, let this pass over me. I don't want to go there. I'm scared of that. I don't want that part of the process. I don't want death in my life. Can it be easier? Can I not have to do it? Is there any other way? Because I don't want this part of the rhythm. He knew that he had to die. He knew that something had to happen. Because he understood why he was here. He knew the whole reason he was at, on earth, that he was the son of God, was to replace something old with something new. It's the whole reason he came. Because Adam and Eve came and they sinned and they messed it up. I mean, we were, we were in the garden, y'all. We were living heaven on earth. It was what it was all about. And then Adam and Eve sinned. And for generations after that, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. There was death, there was sickness, there was pain, there was all of the stuff, and nobody knew where to turn, and nobody could do anything. They tried to do it all themselves. And God said, nah, we've had enough. We've got to do away with that old, and we've got to make something new. I'm sending my son Jesus. And here's how we're going to resurrect the new. The old's got to die. It has to. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. It's, you're going to be afraid of it. You're going to come to me and ask me not to do it. But we've got to allow the process to happen anyways because the only way the new can live is if the old is put to rest. Jesus said. That's what he said. 
He says this, he looks at God and he says, if there's any other way, don't let me have to go through this process. But then he gets to this point, ready? Remember what he said? But it's not what I want. It's what you want. <laughs> what are you even talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about this. In order for something new to spring forth in your life, are you ready for this? Something old has to die. And do you know where most of us live? Most of us live in the place where we want everything new to happen in our life, but we're too afraid to let go of everything old that's in our life. We want the resurrection of fresh. We want the resurrection of a new level. We want the resurrection of something different. We want the resurrection of our purpose and our calling. We want the resurrection of all that God has for us. But we hold on to everything that we're currently in because we don't want to go through the process of death. But can I tell you something? For some of you that are in it right now, like we all are, can I just tell you something? It didn't come to take you out. It came to take you up. Can I get an amen for that? The process that you're in is a part of the rhythm of resurrection. You don't have to run from the pain. You don't have to run from the chaos. You don't have to run from what's going on. You don't have to run from the things that are dying because it's a part of promoting you to your next level. In order for you to be promoted at your next level, you got to die at this level. And nobody likes that part. It's painful. It's hard. It's hard to go through hell. Can we be real, y'all? The last two years, we've all been through hell. Am I alone or can I get an amen? If nothing else, we all went through COVID together, didn't we? We all went through isolation. We all went through the financial hardships. We all have gone through all of the stuff that all of that brought, the fear, the panic, everything, the unrest. But on top of that, guess what? Every one of us, if I grabbed this mic and handed it to you, you could tell a part of your story where it seems like you've been living through crucifixion and death yourself somewhere with everything that's broken out in your life personally. Now, I felt like I had to teach about the rhythm of resurrection because if you don't understand what's going on in your life, you'll think something's wrong because in church we've preached wrong. In church we've preached that if things are going wrong, you must be doing wrong. In church we've preached that if you are submitted to God and you're doing everything God says, then everything's going to be a perfect, smooth path the whole way. There's no obstacles. It'll just be smooth sailing. And if God's hand is on it, it's just going to happen. How many people in here know that that ain't the truth? The truth is actually mostly the opposite of that. The truth is you can sometimes know you're on the right path when all hell's breaking out loose around you because the enemy don't want you to take another step forward to bring God's kingdom like you are doing. So here's why. We get into a moment where it seems like everything in our life is dying and we freak out and we quit. Because we don't understand the rhythm of resurrection. We don't understand that the dying is a good thing. We think it's a negative thing and a bad thing, so we run and we hide and we want out of it and we hit pause and we stop and we're overwhelmed and we don't allow the process to take place to get us to the next place God wants us to be. Matter of fact, I have this, this quote. I, I, sa I saved it on my phone. I saved it on my phone on this picture. It says this, it says, for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must completely come undone. The shell cracks and its insides come out and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it looks like complete destruction. And I know in our life, sometimes when we look at what's going on around us, it looks like things are dying and things are being destroyed. When in all actuality, you've just been given an opportunity to grow. See, when we don't know that, we don't stick out the process long enough to see the harvest on the other side. 
why you have to understand the rhythm of resurrection. I was in here yesterday. I was praying for you for a while. And then I was, I was trying to work on figuring out some lighting stuff with, with someone. And we just ended up talking. It's, it's a guy, he's in town, and he used to, to be a part of our church a long time ago. And, and then he's been away for a while. And lately he's been coming back around a lot more. And I was sitting up here just talking to him. I was hearing his story. And I was just talking about in the past season how he felt being around me and being around here four or five years ago. And I heard a lot that he had to say, and we hugged, and he left, and I ended up going to see him later that day, too. And but After we left that meeting, I, I went over, if you walk across the parking lot to that big building, that's where our offices are, and I have an office over there, and I, walk, I walked over there, and, and I was standing in that office just looking out the window, and I just started crying. I just, I literally, I started crying really hard because it pained my soul to know the person I used to be hurt that person so bad. My desire to be successful, my desire to get to the top, my desire to have the biggest crowd and grow the fastest and do all of the stuff, my desire that was a lot of times selfish had hurt him in ways that I had never heard or knew before that he told me yesterday. And I went over there and I cried because that's never who I ever wanted to be. I didn't want to be the guy that just wanted to get to the top and didn't care how many dead bodies he left behind him in order to get there. I never wanted to be that. But I was that. And you know, just like you, because everybody's got their story over the last two years, just like you, I've been through hell too. And I, I, I've said it this way, I've said it this way, that I wouldn't choose it ever again, but I wouldn't change it. I would change a lot of things I've done. I wouldn't choose it, but I wouldn't change going through hell. Do you know why? I wouldn't change the death that's happened in my life. Do you know why? Because it's made me a completely different person. Because it's destroyed that old part of that, and it's resurrected something brand new in me. I have new desire and new, and new wishes and new prayers and new things. I love people in a way that I never even thought I could love people before. I'm not perfect, but I'm different. But I had to let something old in me die. You know where a lot of us live? A lot of us are so comfortable and old that we keep trying to resurrect a season we're supposed to let die. You know why you're miserable? Because you're spending all your energy giving a season CPR that you should just pull the plug. Let it go. Because death is a part of the resurrection. Am I helping anybody? Some of you got some relationships you should let die. There's relation. I don't know what you're dealing with. You know your life. I don't know it. Business, money, relationships, think, time. What? I don't know what it is. You fill in the blank. You know the season you're in, and you feel death happening all around you, and you're asking God, let it stop, just like Jesus was. But God's like, no, I care too much. See, if he would have said, okay, Jesus, you don't have to die, where would we be? still condemned, still living in sin. But death had to be a part of the process. Don't be afraid of the things that are dying in your life. Let them go. It's the rhythm of resurrection. I wish it got better, but it only gets worse, the next part of the rhythm. You would think, how can you go downhill from death? You actually can. Because not only do you go through the death, but here's the next part of the rhythm. You go through the silence. Hmm. Go through the silence. I, um, can you imagine? I, I want us to picture the disciples in this moment. 
But I want us to really picture them because I don't think we get it because we have something they didn't have. We have the New Testament written. Which means we like pick up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and we can see, oh, Jesus gets up. He lives. They couldn't pick up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They could. They just have to like physically pick them up because they were people at the time. But they couldn't pick up the book Matthew, the book Mark, the book Luke, the book John and read, oh, Jesus gets up. They didn't have that. Here's what they have. They had the fact that they had sold their life out to a guy that said he was the Messiah to give them eternal life, and now he's dead. So can you imagine them? The day that he takes his last breath on the cross, they're just like, what do we do? We laid his body in the tomb. I don't know what to do anymore. I literally left my whole family. I told them they were crazy when they told me I shouldn't go with them. I haven't talked to them. We haven't even spoken to each other. I've been gone for three and a half years. I've given everything. I've debated. I've worked. I've seen miracles. I I fought for this guy. I put my life on the line for this guy. Matter of fact, they don't just want him dead. They want me dead. And they're all locked up in this room, mad, upset. Because here's the truth. Jesus wasn't the only one saying he was the Messiah. There had been people before him. There were people at that time who were revolutionaries, who were trying to rise up against the Roman government, who who were trying to say they were the Messiah too. And they were the ones that said, nah, all of you other guys are crazy. He's the one. He's our guy. He's going to take us to eternity. And now he's dead. In a tomb. And what are they supposed to do? They're hiding in a room for their life. He's laying in a tomb. Is it over? I don't know what to do because nobody's speaking. It's silent. And the silence is deafening. That's the crazy thing about us humans. We hate silence. Don't we? See, you hate this. No, I just watched 22 people start digging in their purses. They were nervous. People started laughing. I saw people grab somebody like, what's he doing? Is he okay? We don't, we don't like silence. We can't stand silence. We're afraid of silence. We try to fill silence in. That's why your TV's on all the time. That's why the radio's going all the time. That's why you're looking at your phone and playing a video all the time. We can't have silence. We don't like silence. Silence is scary. Nobody likes silence. But it is necessary. Do you know Jesus does his best work in the silence? Matter of fact, someone wanted to hear God's voice one time, and an earthquake came, and it was so loud, it shook everything, and then a fire came, and it was roaring and loud, and then the wind came, and it was loud, and then it said said that God was not in the wind, that God was not in the earthquake, that God was not in the fire, but God showed up, and do you know how he showed up? He showed up quiet in a still, small voice. He does some of his best work. In the silence. I let my dad preach one time for Father's Day. <laughs> and he got to preaching, and there's this one thing, he just stopped in the moment, and he was just like this. And after about 20 seconds, I, th- I was like, did he have a stroke? <laughs> like, is he okay? Like, I was on the edge of my seat. I was r- about to run up and grab it. You know, after I talked to him, he said, nah, the Lord was really changing something in my brain from what I wrote, giving me a revelation. But I couldn't stand the silence so long that I wanted to jump to action. <laughs> Listen, I know it sounds hard that, that, that we struggle with the death going on in us, but you know what we struggle with the most, I think? We struggle with the silence. Come on, come on. We think God doesn't hear us. We think he's not listening. We think he's not working. We think he's gone. We think he's run away. 
We think we've done something. To, you know how we do it? When, when something doesn't move the second we think it should move, we start calculating, have we sinned and done all these things why God wouldn't show up? And... See, what you, what you don't know is G- God's working so hard in the silence of your life while you punish yourself thinking you've done something to keep him away when he's been at work the whole time. Well, maybe it's because I did this, or maybe it's because I made this mistake, or maybe it's because this, and he's just back there working. Because he does his best work in the silence. Hmm. I love verse, I love verse, verse six. It says this. It says the angel said, he's not here. He's risen from the dead. Just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. Man, I read that. And I was like, oh, come see where his body. But then the Lord just switched it on me. The Lord said, I want you to read it different. Read it again. So I read it again. I said, come see where his body is lying. I was like, okay. And he said, read it again. Come see where his body was lying. And it hit me. Come see where his body was lying, not laying there, but come see where his body was lying, not telling the truth. Come see where his body was trying to lie and say he's dead in here forever. But what his body didn't know was his spirit was gone and at work. His body was there, and it was trying to lie and say, I'm in a tomb, I'm dead, there ain't no getting up. But while his body was lying, his spirit was working. And I just came to tell some people something. And you need to hear this if you don't hear nothing else that I say today. Just because God is silent does not mean he's absent. See, that was probably one of the most powerful works of the whole process of the resurrection. The whole rhythm was not just the part that he died, but he got laid in a tomb and it got silent. Because you know what he was doing while he was silent? Why everybody, why the disciples were afraid, wondering if their life was over. Why everybody else were getting all the herbs and spices mixed up to embalm him and anoint him. Why everybody was doing everything because they were believing what they thought the body was saying. His spirit, do you know where it was? His spirit had gone to hell in our place. His spirit had gone all the way down to the depths of the earth, looked, the, looked Satan right in the face, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave away from him, and then jumped back up, got back up, and said, I am now the resurrection and the life. Anyone who comes to the Father comes to me, comes to me, comes to the Father. Listen, he became... He went from being Jesus who came to earth to now being Jesus, the Son of God, at the right hand of the Father, who is the name above every other name, who's the Lord of all lords, who every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That was the process that was happening while silence was taking place. While the disciples considered, should I just go back to my own life? It's over now. No, it's just silent. See, he does his greatest work in the silence. I don't know if you, I don't ever take it for granted because so many people come to our church from different backgrounds. Some of you have been in church 30 years. Some of you, this is your first 30 minutes. I don't know if you've even opened the Bible. No judgment. But if you open a physical Bible, we all have phones now with a Bible app. Do they even sell physical Bibles in places still? Well, you've got a physical Bible. Do you know what you do? You go all the way, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you go all the way through the Old Testament, and the last book of the Old Testament is called Malachi. If you turn that page, there'll be a blank page. Turn that page, it'll say New Testament. Turn that page, first book of the New Testament, Matthew. Malachi. Blank page, New Testament. Two pages separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. For us, it's as easy as turning like that in two seconds. But the silence between the two books, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was 400 years of silence. 400. Now, some of you in here are like, I'm 62 years old, I'm old as dirt. Like, number one, you're not. You're super young. <laughs> Moses didn't even start his work till he was 80, by the way. You got plenty of good years in front of you. 
Don't be going and sitting in a recliner and dying. You got too much purpose inside of you. I don't care how old you are in this room. Listen to me now, though. Listen to me. 60 years. Imagine if your entire life you had never seen, heard, thought, or even heard of God or anything that he ever did to be a voice or move or do anything miraculous. We would think that was a lifetime forever. 400 years. 400 years of silence. You got the Old Testament, then you got Jesus coming in the New Testament in between 400 years of silence. But do you know God was doing his greatest work in the silence? You know what was happening in the silence? What was happening in the silence was, was the world was being conquered. <laughs> The world was actually being conquered and it was being taught a brand new language, a brand new language called Koine Greek, which people would have been familiar with even if it wasn't their primary language. And it was a language that people spoke and wrote with that the New Testament is written out of. So a way to communicate for the whole world to understand was being created. Number two, something called Pax Romana was happening, which the world was at so much unrest and so much war in that 400 years, but let me tell you what the Roman Empire did. They came in and they spread themselves out in their colonies and it brought peace to places where they had soldiers and, and places where people could travel in peace, people could, could have peace. Do you know before that happened, they couldn't go from town to town without getting killed, robbed, all kinds of stuff. That was happening. You know what else was happening? A whole road system was being built all across the area uh, to get from one town to the other from ports through the mountains through everything so here you go you got the old testament that's prophesying of a messiah to come that's going to save everybody and then you have 400 years of silence which people would have thought oh they were wrong they lied they missed it because if you don't understand the rhythm of resurrection then you think silence means nothing's happening But what was happening is the stage was being set for the Savior. Because when he came, he had a language to translate the message into the word of God. When he came, he had safety to travel wherever he went. And when he came, he had a road system to get wherever he needed to spread the gospel. 400 years of what seemed like silence was just him at work behind the scenes. I'm preaching in this place. Hmm. It's like the play I went to that time, and I didn't understand because I'm a movie guy, not a play guy. And I didn't know. And they went through the first act, and then the curtains closed. I thought it was over, but I come to find out it was only intermission. <laughs> I went and got me a snack, and I came back, and I sat down. And when they opened that curtain, do you know what happened? Everything behind it had changed. And they had set the stage to take you all the way to the grand finale. That's what's happening in the silence. That's why you can't quit. That's why you can't get up, leave, walk out, get mad at God, get all the, do all the, thi all the things we want to do when we think God's abandoned us. I just came to tell somebody, I just, you just need to hear me. Just listen. I just need to get close. Listen. If he's silent, he's working. Now, you don't know my life. He's silent because I've been so bad. Nah. He knew you were bad far before you were ever even born. <laughs> He ain't scared of your mess. Church people are scared of mess. God's not scared of mess. He likes it messy. So much so that he made us out of dirt. Hmm. It may be silent, but he's working. It's the rhythm of resurrection. I just, I felt so compelled to share this rhythm because, you know what a rhythm is? A, a, a rhythm is a repeated pattern. And you know what, I, I just feel so burdened for. People get so excited in a moment about God. 
but then something doesn't go their way and they quit or they drop off. I really felt so compelled today to share this rhythm of resurrection. You know why? Because you're not just going to go through death and silence once. It's going to be a repeated pattern. Do you know why? Because God doesn't want to leave you on one level. He wants to take you from what the Bible says, from glory to glory. Meaning he wants to move you forward your whole life to what he's created you to do. The Bible says this, it, it, it'll exceed your expectations. <laughs> but how do you get there? You've got to be around when the opportunity shows up. And how are you around if you find the rhythm of resurrection? Because if you find it and you understand it, you won't run from it. You won't be afraid of it. Am I helping anybody? You got to go through the death. You got to go through the silence. And then we get to some good news. This is the last one. You get to the start. And the Lord's really just had this phrase in my mind and in my heart for a couple months now, and I just I wanted to share it with you. He told me this. He, he just really spoke to me and said, Tavner, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. And I felt like I'm supposed to speak that over your life. I don't know where you're at right now, but it's not the end, it's just the beginning. It's not the end, it's just the beginning. I wanted to, to, to share a scripture from, from, from the message, if you don't mind. It's a version of the Bible. Uh, another version, the scripture I'm going to read, says this, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. But the message breaks it down a little bit more, and it says this. It says, if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitation of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bring you alive to himself. And when God lives and breathes in you, as he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you're delivered from that dead life. With his life, with his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. And here's one more phrase that's on there. So you can go for it. What they thought was the end of Jesus was actually just the beginning. If the enemy would have known what he was doing, he would have changed his plans. He thought through the death and through the silence he was bringing an end to something when he was only starting something bigger. Because what seemed to be the end, one body laying in a tomb, turned into the beginning of a multiplication process. Jesus got up from the grave Here's what you got to know about Jesus. He was so powerful because he was a man filled to fullness with the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus, that had never happened before. If you read the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come to people for a minute and then they would do whatever and then it would leave. But Jesus was the first person ever fully human that had all of God in him to the full all the time. So Jesus says when he when he's when he's going to leave he says this he says you're going to do greater things than me do you know why does that mean well, well jesus raised 10 people from the dead we're going to raise 11 that's greater than Je no here's what it means it means you'll do greater things than me because until i was crucified until i went through death until i went through silence and until i got back up it was only one man with the power to do this but now that i endured the cross now that i laid in the grave 
now that I took silence and went down to hell and took all authority back, and now that I've resurrected, it's not the end. It's just the beginning of something greater because now it's not just me. Matter of fact, I'm leaving. I'm going back to heaven and I'm taking this body. But now I'm leaving the spirit that filled me up and it can come on every single one of you. And now where there was one person that could do this, now there's millions of people that can do this. It's just the start. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. The rhythm of resurrection is that you go through the death and you go through the silence, but you, then you've got to get started. It's the beginning. And the Lord just told me to challenge you. Some of you already did it today. During the worship time, we raised our hand and some of you accepted Jesus. You started today. You started today. I'm proud of you. But there's some of you in here, you've known Jesus for a long time. You've just been stuck because you didn't understand this rhythm. You've been running, you've been hiding, and you've been stuck. You know what the Lord told me to tell you today? It's time to get started. Get back at it. Get back on that free throw line. Get back in this rhythm. And let it repeat itself in your life and take you to everything God needs you to be. Because here's what I'm going to declare over every one of you. Not one of you is going to take your last breath without everything God creating you to do coming out of you. In the name and authority of Jesus. I just, I'm going to end the service, but I, I was about to pray right there and walk off. I just feel really compelled that maybe you walked in late and you missed that moment, or maybe you just zoned out and got afraid and missed it. But the Lord just, I really felt like the Lord impressed in me. Give some people an opportunity to surrender to Him again, to be saved. You don't even have to bow your head. You don't have to close your eyes. If that's you and I'm talking to you, be bold and just throw your hand up right now in the room. Who am I talking to? Come on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. I'm talking to some people online. Thank you guys so, back there so much. Thank you. Can we do, we're about to end the service. We're going to pray again and, and, and pray that prayer to accept Christ. As we do that, can we all just stand together in the room? You can pray with us online if that's you too. I want everybody. This is an amazing moment. You want to get started with something new? Get started by giving all you got right here to this prayer to let them know you got their back. Are you ready? Come on, as loud as you can. Everybody in here, just say this. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. I'm yours. I believe that you died. You rose again, and you're alive. Come live in me. Forgive me. Save me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we just lift Jesus up in this place? Yeah! I believe in you. God's got something great he's going to do in your life. Don't quit. Get in the rhythm and watch what he does. Hey, I want to see you back here next week. For real. God got you started. Let's build on it. Find out what's part of the assignment. I love you. Happy Easter. I hope you have the best day. Welcome Pastor Michael to the stage. He's going to dismiss you.